episode of Juicing the Numbers. I'm your host, Joshua Tracy. And I'm Corwin Heller. And today we're talking about a bunch of bullshit. It's Monday, so today is the day that we just kind of run through the events that have brought us interest in the past week, um, or any other n- off-topic topics. So, uh, what do you want to start with today, Corwin? Uh, I feel like the big news is Antonio Brown, if you want to knock that one out of the park and then figure out what the fuck to talk about next, or we can save it for last. No, let's talk about Antonio Brown, All right. because uh, I just don't know what's happening. <laughs> Alright, so full rundown. Antonio Brown, like, last week tweeted a picture of his feet that looked like... It looked like he just shoved his feet into a blender and then just kind of let loose with a couple pulses of that and then was like, all right, let's go play some football. Um, it was absolutely disgusting. If you have a weak stomach, probably don't check it out. If you don't care, it's pretty funny. I didn't know there was a photo. And oh, you need to look up the photo. Oh, I'm not sure I want to see it, but I kind of really want to see it. I did not know there was a photo. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, let no. me just google this real quick oh yeah put that in your search history (laughs) brown feet kink (laughs) don't need that last word corwin why is this an x hamster link (laughs) why is this bookmarked (laughs) oh my god so basically the whole bottom of his foot's coming off 100 percent. it's basically his foot is a giant blister that is severely peeling off um like it's several Thick layers of blisters, all that shebang. I hope you're all on your way to work, drinking your coffee, doing whatever lovely stuff you could be doing right now. Eating a croissant. But regardless, he comes out and he's like, yeah, I was doing some cryotherapy and basically a giant steel tube that you stand in. It gets to like negative 40 degrees. You stand in there for like two, three minutes, however long it is, and then you get out. And he's like, yeah, I got frostbite on my feet from standing in there, which... Set off some alarms by how do you get frostbite in like five minutes in a cryotherapy tube when you're supposed to be wearing shoes and everything. So I heard a thing about this. Right. Do you you have it? About the guy who was posting the thread about how it's not that. Instead, it's... Oh, what I had heard was that what was most likely is that um, apparently they tell you very, very explicitly before you get in one of these things to dry the fuck off. Like, do not have any moisture, like sweat, or like wet clothing on your body before you do it, because that is how you get frostbite, because water con- is a much better conductor for cold and heat than your skin is, mm-hmm. and Antonio Brown just disrespected that, like he was wearing like wet socks, or, or he like hadn't dried off his feet, the bottoms of his feet, or some shit like that, and that's how it ended up happening. Mm-hmm. That's what I had heard was being, not like what it, what had happened, but like what was a likely story give me yours I'm so what i heard was that basically there's a you know you wear these tight cleats you wear these you know sweaty socks going through practice if you overly sweat and it basically just soaks into your feet and you leave it like it it's going to cause these like superimposed blisters um i read this like a week ago so this is definitely not the best rendition of this but basically it's just a a foot infection he had from not taking care of his feet and that's why it's you know these whole layers of blisters and all that kind of stuff um i forget the name of the guy but he was the former uh he was at least on the medical staff for the chargers back in the day for a couple years um and he was tweeting about it so that's what i went off of for the first couple days i like your idea because that is you know actually in line with what he says happened and also in line with Antonio Brown being a dumbass. Yeah, I was going to say, it, it, um, it, 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 it works because it like seems to make sense logically and because, yeah. wow, Antonio Brown is fucking stupid. And it, it absolutely would do something like that. Uh, yeah, of course he would. So he hasn't been playing in training camp, Shocking. hasn't been practicing. Again, not surprising. Um, and then... He didn't want to be out of the limelight for too long. Right, so... I honestly don't even know how this all started because it's not like he was coming back. He kind of went dark for a little bit and people weren't really sure what was going on, what his you know status was with his feet, with his comeback, how in shape he was, where he was. The Raiders had no idea. So it then comes to light that Antonio Brown wasn't happy with the team's equipment staff because 
they wouldn't allow him to wear the helmet that he's been wearing for the past, you know, several years in the NFL. And it's not that be- the Raiders didn't want him to wear this helmet. It's that the NFL forbade pl- all players from wearing this specific helmet. So guys like Tom Brady, uh, Antonio Brown, Aaron Rodgers, guys who all wore the same helmet, along with 31 total players, were all like, yeah, you guys got to change that. And Tom Brady changed his helmet. Aaron Rodgers changed his helmet. Antonio Brown was like, y'all motherfuckers, you can't make me change my helmet. Like, fuck you. Like, you don't see Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers getting, you know, put under the microscope here and making them change. I'm not practicing unless I can have, you know, my helmet. And they were like, uh, what the fuck? So Antonio Brown doesn't practice. Equipment staff finds a video of Aaron Rodgers practicing in a new, different helmet and sent it to Antonio Brown, which caused him to come back the next be like next day and be like, all right, I got you. And he wears a new helmet that day. The third day, he comes back and tries to sneak on an, an old-style helmet, and it doesn't work. They force him to take it off, leave practice, whatever it is. And then he comes back with his Steelers helmet, which was the old design, spray painted black and silver for the Raiders colors, poorly, by the way. They, Shockingly. They mentioned how it was not an exact replica. It was done very clearly off color. You know how like cut four on Twitter, anytime a player gets traded, does like those poor like drawings over yeah. of a player's like biopic to like their new team. I guess you, you know? saw Antonio Brown's. No, I'm saying but that would be hilarious if he did They had one like that. Oh did they really I don't know if it was cut four specifically, but it was uh Ted Nigan. Uh I follow him on Twitter. He's a good analyst uh yeah, specifically for the Raiders. Um he posted that picture of like the Steelers helmet and then what he would have done to do it, and it's just a really bad MS Paint. You ever seen that video of um, I forget what team put it forward uh, as a uh, as like a as a social media promo, but it was like they went into like the the team's locker room and asked a bunch of NFL players to draw the logos for other teams. Yeah, and they did they did not do a good job. No, <laughs> it was really funny. Yeah. Anyway, so we're up to day, that's day three, something like that. I don't know specifics. I don't have the thread in front of me. Um, Michael Silver Silva on Twitter had a really nice thread. It was a 20 part thread on Twitter that wow. broke this all down. Yeah. I was reading it at work and Ethan and I were just kind of like, are you like going through like the big important stuff? And it's like, what the fuck is this? Like, this is absolutely nuts. You know, what's crazy is I was just talking to Scarlett the other day about how there was a point in time where Antonio Brown was considered like the most drama free wide receiver one in the league. Yeah. You remember that? Uh, I that do. Was a very long Scott time ago. Was like, I don't remember that. Like Scott, Scott was like, no, like that was a real thing. He's like, because he's, you know, Antonio Brown's been a Raider for a handful of months, and uh, it's been a roller coaster. It's all right. So let me. I pulled up the thread. It is Michael Silver. So tweet thirteen of twenty. Brown once again tried to take the field with his old helmet which he had since had repainted with colors approximating, but not completely mimicking, the Raiders' silver and black design. Beautiful. Um, So he said that wasn't allowed. He was forced to wear the new model. Before training camp, uh, he thought... So these were OTAs. Yeah. Like, way in the beginning. At the start of training camp, the Raiders were like, all right, this is clearly over with. He's not that crazy. You know, he's past it. But he still comes to practice for the two days before, you know, leaving with his foot injury and tried to sneak his old helmet on both days. Um, He's still freaking out about it. Instead of one Raiders player, hasn't been here for a while. Nobody knows where he is. It's just no one knows what the fuck is going on. And that's the best part. Yeah, I don't even know what to make of this anymore, honestly. I I I had heard that he wanted to wear the old helmet because the new ones had a brim that stuck farther out mm-hmm. and he had a harder time tracking balls. And the reason I don't believe that <laughs> is because they are approved by the NFL, who I think has an understanding that people catch balls in the league and wouldn't do that, um, at least to such a dramatic point that it, like, 
causes that to happen. And so, and if it did, Antonio Brown would not be the only person complaining on it, about it. You know this. what I mean? Yeah. Like, and you'd it, see, like, Michael Thomas and Julio Jones. You'd see everyone else being like, yo, we can't see balls no more. And that's not happening because Antonio's full of shit. I just really love how... So this, I think, dates back to that really bad perfect hit on Antonio Brown uh, in the playoffs like three years yeah, ago. Yeah, I remember that. We saw that one live when we were watching uh, at, at Artie's with Skyler's band playing, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, damn, that was that long ago. Yeah. Holy shit. Um, but I remember after that, he just seemed a little different. And leading up to last year, it was, you know, nothing anything crazy enough to be anything of note. You know, it's like, all right, Antonio Brown, you know, best receiver in the NFL, has so much money. He could do these kind of things. We'll allow that. But this past season, things just got ramped up. Like, things just went exponentially off the charts. And everyone in the Steelers, like, subreddit and on the NFL subreddit was like, oh, shit, the Steelers are fucked. This guy, you know, he's so done with the Steelers. Like, this is what... Your locker room is like you just have all these, you know, players like this with Le'Veon Bell, Antonio Brown, Martavis Bryant, like Tomlin can't control the locker room. These guys are nuts. And then we're like, all right, we're trading them. And we trade them for far below market value. Everyone says the Raiders fleeced us. We're like, yeah, sure, whatever. I wasn't happy with what we got, but I understood why the price was so low. And now I really really understand why the price was so low and how we were just happy to offload him and his contract and everything involved. And I'm going to miss the talent on the field, but I think the team as a whole, as a whole 53-man roster, 90-man roster, whatever it may be, is better off without that kind of culture in the locker room. And granted, I've never been in that locker room with any of these players. I can't speak firsthand about what it's like with him there and what he adds or takes away from it. But I definitely don't miss the drama. Uh, as a Steelers fan, how are you enjoying the drama from the outside looking in? I now? really love it. <laughs> so there was one tweet. As I take a sip of coffee, there's a gif of Roy Williams, who is the head coach of the uh, North Carolina Tar Heels. And it's him, like, dancing, walking into a locker room. Oh, here it is. Of just, like, him going crazy with all of his players and, like, dancing around. And it's just, like, this old white dude just having a blast with all these young guys. And that's exactly how I feel as a Steelers fan. Just like, you know what? I don't got to deal with this anymore. And it's really fucking funny that you do. I'm happy for you, bud. (laughs) I'm happy for you. You know, the Steelers, just such a lowly franchise in the NFL. It's nice to win one for once, you know? Yeah, yeah, truly, truly. It's been a, it's been a hard road for Steelers fans these past few months. Uh, yeah, anything else on Antonio Brown? As a Jets fan, how do you feel about this? I feel like we got the right Steeler. Yeah, <laughs> I do too. Yeah, as I much feel like hate we got as, the right Steeler. As much hate as Bell got over the years, he at least has his head on straight for the most part. Yeah, the he, only thing he he does that I think is a little bit questionable is his rap career. Well, yeah, but he he made some really good points where it's like, if you work a nine to five job and go home and play video games all night and have some other hobbies, nobody gives a shit. I'm a football player. When I'm done practicing, does it matter what I go home and do in my spare oh, time? Of course not. No, and it's like, shit, Le- Lev, you got you got us there, man. Yeah, oh, he's basically like, imagine if every SoundCloud rapper did just use a, a, a generic term, had Le'Veon Bell's money. Exactly. They would all be doing what he's doing. Oh, of course. And no one would blame them. So, yeah. But because he needs to focus on football, everyone thinks it's this huge deal that... Yo, that shit's such trash. I hate that oh, shit. Oh, God, yeah. Like, there's Shut sometimes, up and run. Like, there's sometimes when I get it, and it's not great, like, if you're a quarterback, and you're going out to like parties in Miami on you know weeks or days that you should be like studying film and you're just not like preparing yourself the same way that other peers in your position do okay that's questionable but Lev if you're fucking rapping on a 
Thursday afternoon after your practice, yeah, go for it. I don't give a shit. Yeah, it, it always bothers me because I've never heard a, a pundit of any kind give a player shit for doing like too much charity work. Oh yeah, like hey man, you're spending too much time at your charity organization. You need to <laughs> you need to shut up and dribble. You know, that's a really need, great point. It drives me fucking nuts because we all know that there's bad players who have been yeah. like put up for the Walter Payton Man of the Year award. Yeah, you know, like there have been poor players who still run great charities and mm-hmm. like i've never heard anyone be like hey stop helping kids with cancer <laughs> and focus on being a left guard <laughs> i'm sure there are some eagles and patriots fans somewhere that have absolutely done that <laughs> the two most likely fan bases to do that yeah but uh yeah. did you see the video of two eagles fans jumping a titans fan after the preseason game jumping a Titans? oh fan my god for a preseason at- game yeah so basically the titans beat the eagles in their preseason game which do not matter nobody gives a fuck for reference before the lions went defeated 0 and 16 in 2008 they won all four of their preseason games and before the cleveland browns went defeated in 2018 no Uh, 17 they went 4-0 in their preseason series as well so preseason games really really could not matter less yeah, I'm trying to find the tweet uh, that was involved. Granted, this was a couple days ago, so I'm probably not going to find it. But basically what happened was two Eagles fans jump a guy wearing a Titans t-shirt after the preseason game and just beat him bloody and then run off. And it's like, holy shit, NFL fans are fucking stupid. Yeah, that sounds like Philadelphia. The the fan base that threw batteries at Santa Claus. Yep. <laughs> Oh my God! Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is very on brand for Philly. Yeah. Uh, have you been watching any of the preseason? No, no, because uh, regular season Yankees took took precedent over preseason Jets. Fair enough. Uh, although I did walk by my brother watching the uh, the Jets Giants preseason game, and I actually thought with the new uniforms we were the Seahawks for a second, <laughs> and I was like, "Why the fuck is is Cliff watching the Seahawks?" Uh, for me to realize that no, that is that's uh, that's what the Jets look like now. How do you feel about the uniforms? So I only had like a passing glimpse. I was not a fan of them when they first came out, and I'm going to stick to that for now. Fair enough. Um, but now is the time when we get a seam in game action, and as many Jets fans have said, if they win in these uniforms, these will become your favorite uniforms, and yeah. uh, that's probably accurate. So mm-hmm. I'm going to give it a season. I. Can't say I prefer them to the old ones, but the old ones are so clean. Yeah, they are really clean. Um, the only thing I didn't like about the Jets uniform, I never really liked the helmet and the logo they had. The logo was pretty bland. I think I think most Jets fans were like, if we could keep most of the old uniform but change the logo to something more current, cool. Right. And instead, they changed everything about the uniform and made the logo more retro. I wouldn't even say more retro. I'd say more. So the reason that I didn't like the Jets logo is that it was just so generic and plain. It the was old Jets logo or the new the, one? Well, I'm going to get to that, but the old okay. one. Uh, because it was a football-shaped sphere with, in black letters, NY, and then in white letters on the forefront, Jets. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could not have been more boring. It's something that you would find in a clip art gallery. It was like, yeah, it was like you know, uh, you know, we're making this show about uh, NFL teams, but none of the logos got approved. We need to make our own. Uh, okay, let's throw a football with some letters in it. So, yeah, that sounds perfect. Yep. So what the Jets fans were hoping for was a more stylized version of the word Jets to either reflect the city of New York or the idea that we are named after planes, you know. And we what we got instead was, hey, let's take the football that the Jets word is in and just put it below the word jets and uh, that's what we have now i actually want to look up like the official logo just to see yeah it's it's a big arcing uh it's a big convex jets with a football underneath the word and it's just as generic as the previous one was oh the one on the, the helmet i should say is different but that that's uh actually i think that's actually the old one um but yeah it's 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 not pretty i'm not a fan Oh yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. I see what you mean. Where like that's the old one, that's the new one. Yeah, the helmets. I that's, I don't not, know. that's not the new helmet. That's, that, the, new that's hel- the old helmet. Oh wait, is this the new helmet? Yep, there it is. Yeah, I don't like that. No, it's pretty fucking bad. That's really that is like 
high school football division three type and i really hate the color of the helmet yep yep um so again you know if if they do their winning if they if they win in these helmets people will care a lot less because they wanted them oh for sure but uh oof is uh is all i really have to say about these uh these jets helmets uh may i pivot to baseball go for it so brett gardner got ejected the other day love seeing that did you see it? I did see it. I need to talk about this. Go for because it. Because I have, in my in my 11 years of watching Brett Gardner play baseball, I've never seen him so mad. And can I share with you the most interesting stat I saw? 100% you um, can. In regards to this dejection specifically. In Brett Gardner's 11-year MLB career, how many times do you think he's been ejected? Um, Give me an honest, honest guess. Honest guess, I think he has four ejections. You are so spot on. This was his fifth career ejection. Awesome. Yeah. That's not a lot. <laughs> no, it's not. That is, that is a very low number. That is not a lot. He is averaging, like, that's basically one ejection. Before this one a few days ago, that's basically averaging one ejection every, like, three years. Like, that is so fucking few. And I was talking to Cal about it because she's like, why did he get thrown out? I don't understand. And I was trying to explain to her how the MLB umps are basically the lords of baseball where they are untouchable and how their only recourse is really not getting playoff series, which apparently you can sue about for racial discrimination, a la uh, yeah. uh, Angel, fucking, Hernandez. Angel Hernandez. Thank you. Uh, it's it's a sham. It's an absolute sham. It's ridiculous. Absolute sham. And um, I don't know. I think there needs to be... So if you were, if you were commissioner of baseball... Which what, I strive to be one day. What's your plan? For this happens, and you, s- you see this, yeah, and you're, you're, you're Corwin Heller, Lord and GM of all of baseball, and you get to call this umpire into your into your chambers and say, all right, Jimmy, you done fucked this one up. Now it's time for the hammer. Um, I think there should be reviews on all ejections by the MLB, you know, main office in New York. Um, and I think there needs to be ser- like serious performance incentives tied to the umpires, whether it be, you know, they already have the, you know, you're not going to ump in the postseason if you don't perform in the regular season, shit like that. But there needs to be, you know, maybe some monetary incentives, some other bullshit incentives that umpires might care about, shit like that, because this is ridiculous like there needs to be serious reform in how the umpire union and player union and mlb front office figure out how to go about this so let me just go through what happened for for everybody because uh this has become my new favorite thing um the yankees were complaining as they do as every mlb team does about the strike zone so uh, Cameron Mabin got rung up on a very low strike three, and the Yankees bench said some shit. And then Mike Talkman goes up to to bat, and he takes a low strike one pitch out of the zone, strike one pitch. And well, the Yankees bench has some things to say about that too. And what the ump decides to do, and this is really just quite outlandish of a thing to do, is without even looking at the Yankees bench, which means he did not issue a warning. He didn't say, all right, guys, cut it out. He didn't say, next time someone's gone. Didn't even look at, the man was looking in center field, said, all right, I'm done, and then threw someone out. And so if you look look at the video, the first thing Aaron Boone does is look at him and go, who? <laughs> Who did you just throw out? Is it me? I don't understand. He was literally standing there, pointing at himself, pointing back at the ump, and just doing the shrugs. Just yeah, like, he, what? Like, yeah. Who? Boone was all shoulders. Like, like he was so confused. <laughs> and Gardner was just sitting behind him, like, drinking out of a bottle of water. So, which, so eventually, the ump just looks in the dugout and seemingly just points and just says the name of whoever he pointed out and says, Gardner. And so Gardner, in the meantime, is still sitting on the bench just like, man, who'd they throw out? Like, he's, like, not there yet, you know? And then someone, I think, like, nudges him and goes, Brett, they threw you out. He goes, me? Me? (laughs) 
<laughs> and the man comes out calmly at first. You know, he, he kind of like speed walks deliberately up up the steps. And then he goes, did I get thrown out? And then one of the other umps says, like, yeah, you got thrown out. And then he fucking charges. That was the best at, part. At, at the home plate ump. Gets grabbed. J- Boone grabs the the collar of, of Gardner's jersey to try to, like, hold him back. And Gardner does a fucking swim move around that shit. And just gets in the ump's face and shouting, I didn't fucking say anything. I didn't fucking say anything. The fuck you saw? I didn't fucking say anything. <laughs> And the ump's like, I heard you say something. He goes, no, I fucking didn't. And so the funniest part about this is that they have an angle of when Talkman took the strike one pitch that looks in on the Yankees dugout. And Gardner didn't say anything. No. <laughs> like, it's not even like he could be like, you know, he was talking, but like, I didn't say you suck. I said, I really don't like these sunflower seeds. Like, he couldn't even like, he didn't say anything. Like, he actually was just... Hanging out like a baseball player does. Just sitting in a dugout, drinking his water, playing with his bat. And so this is what I find to be so bizarre and interesting about this particular ejection is that the ump is actually verifiably full of shit. Yeah. Because it's not like the ump could be like, you know, he said something, whatever, he said this, he said that, you know, like, I don't know what they would possibly come up with. But the ump said... I'm throwing out Brett Gardner because he was drawn about a strike pitch and you can't argue balls and strikes. When there is video evidence that Brett Gardner didn't open his fucking mouth and couldn't have. Mm -hmm. And that to me has become a very interesting abuse of authority. And I'm really curious if this particular instance, much like the... um, the Derek Jeter non-home run in uh, the playoffs where that kid... uh, it's a famous name of a kid too, because of this particular instance mm-hmm. where he reached out from the wall and grabbed the home that would not have been a home run, and it should have been fan interference. But there was this was pre replay, and the umps called it a home run. It was against the Orioles in '96, and um, that was the catalyst for replay. That one play because it was so egregious. Right. Uh, I wonder. Now, this, uh, this might not be the most egregious example of an ejection, but considering all the video evidence there is to, like, why it shouldn't have happened, if this could be a catalyst for something. Like, we all know that this kind of bullshit where the ump just kind of picks a random player because they made eye contact first and they're the ones getting thrown out type of deal happens. We know the umps make these kind of ego-based calls seemingly at random. But this is the first time where we've had this solid evidence and proof that this is just random bullshit and it's just an ego trip by the umps. I really hope it happens because I think it's the absolute worst part of baseball. It's like everyone complains about flopping in soccer, but it's not the actual players flopping. It's the fucking referees who should be managing the game. And that's the worst part. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, it, it's it's about what you can get called, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've been thinking as I've been thinking about this over the past couple of days because this Gardner ejection happened, I think, like on Friday. Yeah, it was like two days ago. Um, and today's Sunday, so we're actually recording this very close to when this releases, which never happens. And you got to imagine that as time marches forward, the umpires' union is going to have a lot less leverage as the advent of robo umps becomes more prevalent. Mm-hmm. Since they're already in um, pro baseball now, they're already in the Pacific League, I believe, or the Atlantic League, one of the know. two. Yeah, they're they're in they're in um, one of the independent indie leagues right now, which is usually a stepping stone for going into affiliated leagues. Right, and since it's kind of knocking on the door here, I think that if the, I think the only reason Robo Umps aren't in baseball right now is because the umps we have are fine. And uh, I'm going to put that in quotes. As a whole. F- yeah, fine. And the owners don't want to have to like upset the u- uh, umpires union and mm-hmm. do all that stuff and then like put in all the tech for it and blah, 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 blah. But if the uh, commissioner of baseball wants to make a change and wants to 
sap some authority from the umpires union. I mean, and the umpires union wants to like go on strike like they they did uh, a few years ago. They'd have a lot less leverage because at that point you could just call up a whole bunch of other umps from other places, have robo umps do most of the work, and then and, just have those umps there for, and then potentially it, it, second level just. I don't know what the word for it. redundancy. I guess. Yeah, yeah. Basically, all the umps that just went on strike, fuck them. Yeah, you know, like they don't need to pay Joe West to get. He's probably the highest paid ump in baseball <laughs> since he's been there for so long. Like they don't need him back. They have robo umps now. Three things I could totally see Angel Hernandez going like not going on strike per se, and the MLB is just like Angel man, what the fuck are you doing on strike? You're out of here. You're fired. You know, get out. He's like, I'm, I'm not on strike. Oh, Angel, what are you doing on strike right now? Get out of here. <laughs> and just forcing him out of the league. That'd be I great. have two other things. Yes. I forgot both of them off the top of my... Okay, one of them... <laughs> <laughs> um, it's live, pre-recorded radio, folks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, how do you think this would fare in uh, something like football where, yes, the referees went on strike back in the day do you think they would have done that if there was any ability for the nfl to put in a essentially robotic version of them in football where it's just everything's booth review type deal honestly i i kind of think the nfl probably could do that right now i mean they have like live uh people in a booth looking at every single nfl game already Mm -hmm. i think all you'd really need is earpieces and uh, and and warm bodies on the on the field, you know. Just then, when you could have some dude in the booth, just be like, uh, "Yeah, throw your flag, uh, number thirty four, holding." And then flag thrown, number thirty four, offense holding five yard, or I guess offense would be a ten yard penalty, whatever. Um, replay second down. And like, I don't think it would be. Maybe I'm oversimplifying it by like a right. fuck ton, but I like, feel like it, it might slow it down a bit. It probably would. It probably would. But I think that the NFL, as that would get quicker, as I imagine it would, I think the NFL will also have more leverage over its refs. That's true. Yeah. And I think they're, the real they're, question here is basketball. Yeah. Basketball does have some shitty refs. I mean, I feel like everything has shitty refs. Yeah, but I feel like basketball gets the, like, they have the second most power while also making, like, the most errors. Yeah, I guess so. Because I'm going to say true. baseball has the most power. Um, oh, but, for sure. I mean, they throw people out of games for saying regularly <laughs> yeah regularly for doing the most asinine shit yeah plus just in general calling balls and strikes I like mean, no other game has that kind of level of control they have a say on every single action in that game yeah you have to tell an ump whether you as a pitcher are going to be throwing from the stretch or the wind up because they can call a bulk if you don't do that seriously yeah dead ass if, if you if you want to uh, if you're a pitcher and like the bases are loaded and you're like all right I don't have to throw from the stretch anymore because there's no more threat of stealing. I want to throw from the windup. Like, you have to go tell an up that. Like, you have to make it clear that, like, hey, hey, I'm going to throw from my windup. Don't call this a balk. Because mm-hmm. if you don't do that, they're going to call it a balk and everyone's going to advance a base. But, like, what is a balk? It's, uh, you know, it's um, it's when you do that thing where you balk a lot <laughs> and uh, your legs are moving where they shouldn't. <laughs> and uh, And sometimes you spit funny. And that one, that one's a balk too. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching some video about how Andy Pettit got like really good at picking off people at first base, and he was like, "Yeah, I don't know if it was legal, and I just got really good at hiding it, and it worked out sometimes. And sometimes I got called for it, but yeah, it happens. I don't know if it is legal or not." Yeah, Andy Pettit, king of the pickoffs. Um, anyway, just sticking with the with the theme of ejections, though, I was curious. So, what's frustrating is that apparently player ejections are not kept track of. How? I have no idea. I combed through Baseball Reference. This is baseball we're I talking did, about. They keep track of everything. I know. Like I combed through Baseball Reference. I did like advanced Google searches. Like I pulled up like different advanced baseball. Google searches. I know. Ooh. I did like that whole plus shit, and there was quotes and like everything. Um. And I looked through, like, a few other, like, different, like, baseball, like, stack keeping track of places. Nothing. What I do have, though, is manager ejections, which is kept very much so track of. And I just want to know who you think leads this list of manager ejections all time. All time? Oh, fuck. Um, it's going to be some guy that I'm not going to know until 
Um, the Mets old manager. The the Mets old manager? Yeah. Oh, Casey Stengel? No. Uh, the most recent Mets manager. Oh, um, fucking something with a T, right? Tom. Something. Fuck. I like. I know his face so clearly. I just can't think of it. Yeah, I know. I'm I assuming know it's not him. Then I know exactly it. who you're talking about. It's not him. Um, there are out of the top ten. There's definitely going to be a few names you know here. Okay, so lay them on me. I thought it was going to be Earl Weaver. Okay, because Earl Weaver is famous for his ejections. Right. I don't know if you've ever seen any on on YouTube. I absolutely have. They're wonderful. Earl Weaver is also a fascinating human being because he he loved smoking cigarettes in the dugout. And had special made Orioles uniforms that had cigarette Pass. patches, like pouches, in the uniform so that he could have his cigarettes like readily accessible to him. It's fucking amazing. Good on him. He knows what he likes. Yeah, and like listening to like Ken Singleton, who's a broadcaster for the Yankees, who was a former player for Earl Weaver, tell Earl Weaver stories is fucking hysterical. Um Anyway, I thought he was going to be number one. He is not. He's number four. Okay. With 94 ejections. That's a lot. That's so many. So there has to be someone who's broke 100. Oh, there's two. Ooh. And a number one is number one by so fucking much. Really? Yeah. It's Bobby Cox. Bobby Cox. Bobby Cox was uh, the manager. Of, he was a manager for 29 years. He managed, uh, I think most famously, the... Um, Atlanta, uh, not Falcons, Jesus. Atlanta yes, Braves. the Atlanta Falcons. Um, but he also, apparently, for like four years there, managed the Blue Jays. He managed the Braves from 78 to 81, the Blue Jays from 82 to 85, and then the Braves from 90 to 2010. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I didn't realize he actually you know managed any team other than the Braves. If he still coached the Atlanta Falcons, he still would be coaching Deion Sanders. True. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you'd be right. Uh, very good manager, so he, he managed forever. Uh, 4,500 games, 4,508 games managed. 2,504 wins, 2,001 losses, three ties, just to show how fucking old this man is. Uh, for a 556 win percent, uh, he was he won the 1995 World Series, five-time pennant winner, four-time manager of the year. He got thrown out. Like I said, Earl Weaver, a lot of, a lot of ejections, 94 of them. Bobby Cox. 158. Sweet baby Jesus. <laughs> I mean, damn. Do you think he like had a routine down by number 158 or 154? I already forgot what number it was. 158. I don't even know. Like I don't I don't even know. I don't even know what to say here. Like I I, I didn't So I I know who Bobby Cox is kind of only because right. like I I He's been around New, for so long, it's yeah. hard not to know the name Bobby Cox. I didn't realize he managed for so long. Like, I didn't realize he managed the Blue Jays. I didn't realize... Like, I, I knew he was there for the 95 World Series. Like, I didn't... I don't watch National League Baseball in general. Like, I don't know much about him otherwise. Uh, I definitely did not know he got thrown out of 158 games. That's so much. And what's funny is that, like, most of the people on this list are uh, b- b- pretty fucking old. Uh, so, the second most ejections ever. We'll do, like, the top five here. Um, John McGraw. Sure. Yeah, uh, he was a manager uh, from 1899 to 1932. So he started his uh, managerial career with the Baltimore Orioles, who became the New York Yankees um, when they moved to New York. And he then managed the New York Giants forever, and uh, he got thrown out of 118 games. That's a lot of games. That's a lot of games, especially when like the seasons uh, were not as long. No, <laughs> and I feel like you really had to earn your ejections back then. Yeah, like you know? they're kind of handed out like candy here on Halloween. I feel like back in the day, it was a serious, serious event when you are thrown out of a baseball game. Because like in eighteen ninety nine, they're still learning the rules. <laughs> <laughs> What's this? What happens when you hit it over the fence? I don't know. John, John, we've had enough. Go home. I don't know. This is bu- John. Un- leave. We're not John, we're not playing until you go home. <laughs> like how someone stole the first base. Go back to first. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, imagine like the guy stealing first base for the f- or like stealing second base for the first time. It's just like I wanted it and I took it. 
No, but it's basically what happened. Back off. It was yeah. a, everyone thought it was a joke. Everyone was like, ha, 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 ha. What a qu- clever, witty joke. Go back to first base. And he was like, no, I want to be at second. <laughs> what are you going to do about it? Do you think they just kind of stood there staring at each other? It's like, I'm not pitching until you go back to first. Well, I'm not going back to first, so you better pitch. And Honestly, they just stood there for a couple hours. and from, then From all accounts, it's kind of what happened. Eventually, the guy just pitched, and it was a rule. Yeah, the, the umps decided that because it's not in the rule book that you can't do it, they would just like let him do it, and so like that's kind of how it went. But like everyone like was kind of upset about it. Everyone thought it was a joke. Then everyone was mad, and then everyone was like, "Well, I guess we made a new rule today." So, do you think it ever happened where like someone tried to do something not specifically in the rule book, and they were just like, "No, you can't fucking do that." Oh Billy. sure, there's a whole rule because um, a player manager back in like the early days of baseball, like like 1900s, but like I don't know when. Um, he was a player manager, and he was not playing that day. So what he did was there was a pop fly, and it was going foul, and it was going into his dugout. Mm-hmm. So he walked, he he shouted, uh, his name, like, manager's, manager's name, now in the game, catches mm-hmm. the ball, and then just puts himself in the game. <laughs> so to count it as an out. That's fucking amazing. And, uh, yeah, they outlawed that the next day. <laughs> <laughs> Did he just do that? Uh, yeah. Again, Can he do that? Uh, I don't see why not. It's not in the rules that you can't do it, so you might as well do it. Uh, yeah. Oh, baseball, you're fun. Yeah, I don't really have too much else. Um, I was looking through uh, baseball reference because I said I haven't been doing it in a while. Oh, um, third most ejections ever is Leo DeRoche. Uh, DeRocher, uh, he managed the Brooklyn Dodgers and the New York Giants and the Chicago Cubs and the Houston Astros when they were in the National League. Uh, and he got thrown out of a whole bunch of games, so I think like 96. I already closed the tab. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Where's Buck Walter on this list? That's an interesting question. Um, I already closed it, but I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to open back up and let's find Buck. Um, Buck Walter is tied for 44th. He has been thrown out of 32 games, which actually really isn't that much. And the only name I know of that he is tied with is Don Mattingly. Damn. So what are you well, going to do now, Buck? So, Buck Showalter played or managed for 20 seasons. Yep. And he got thrown out of 32 games. Don Mattingly has managed for nine seasons and has already been thrown out of 32 games. Way to go, Don. I'm really proud of you, bud. Oh, anyway, uh, from the top 10 names Corwin would know uh, Tony La Russa, number five. Perfect. Yeah. I know him. 86 ejections. Active manager, number seven, Ron Gottenheyer from the Detroit Tigers. There you go. Uh, active manager for now, number nine, Bruce Bochy. I knew he was going to be somewhere on the list. Uh, Joe Torrey's number 12. Okay. I'm well aware of Joe Torrey. Yeah, no one's coming close to anything else, though. I mean, yeah, it's too far. It, 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 this is a lost art, the ejection. But I wanted to ask you, Corwin. Okay. So, uh, stat, uh, not stat cast, I'm just so used to it. Um, baseball reference allows you to look up leaderboards by age. Okay. And I have me curious because it starts at 18, and I don't think I know any 18-year-old baseball players. Like Wonder pro Frank, ball players. Oh, pro ball players? Yeah. I uh, don't know any that were in the game at 18. I'm not sure if there were. Well, there is a leaderboard for it, so I have it. We'll just <laughs> do a few of the basic ones. Um, batting average. Give me a, a guess. Any young ball player? Who the fuck played at eighteen years old, though? That's what I was. I, I was thinking like Alex right, Rodriguez. I was thinking A Rod. I was thinking Mickey Mantle. Uh, and I was thinking like maybe like Bryce or Manny. Those were both nineteen. Yeah, I know. I'm just trying to think of young yeah. dudes. You know, that's the problem with eight. So the batting average leader, um, like the actual average, is two seventy six, which is like not high. Uh, it was nineteen oh four. Yikes! And it was by some guy named Johnny Lush. Uh, names Corwin might recognize. There's only one. Robin Yount. We talked about him yeah. briefly before. Not in depth, but no, yeah. No, briefly. Uh, he was an M- He won the MVP for uh, the Milwaukee Brewers back when they were in the American League. Um, that's all I know about him. He played shortstop. Yeah. Uh, so fucking... So what's funny is that this entire leaderboard page yeah. is entirely either Johnny Lush... Or some guy from 1935 named Phil Cavaretta. Huh. 
Yeah, so like Johnny Lush leads in batting average, on base, and wow, actually that's kind of... Oh, adjusted OPS plus and stolen bases. Phil Caravetta, Cavaretta leads in slugging, OPS, games played, at-bats, played appearances, runs, scored, hits, bases, doubles, triples, home runs. How many home runs do you think he hit to have the most of any 18-year-old? Twelve. Eight. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. So listen to how drastically this changes, though. When we go to 19. Yeah, I figured it would. Okay. I feel like Bryce Harper, Juan Soto are going to be up there. Mickey Mantle. No. No? Uh, Well, it depends what we're looking at here. Okay. I should uh, should correct. Batting average, who do you got? No idea. Mel Ott. Oh, okay. Yeah, Mel Ott's a pretty famous name. Uh, His batting average as a 19-year-old is 322. Oh, fuck. (laughs) So we went from uh, batting average for uh, the best... 18 year old season ever of 276 um which I, I guess means you have to qualify maybe it doesn't matter to 322 which is huge massive jump yeah uh second place ty cobb really ty cobb good at baseball <laughs> yeah some might say uh third base uh sorry third place i actually don't know who this is cesar sedeno cesar hernandez cesar sedeno Sedeno, there's a there's a there's a tilde there. Uh, yeah, he's uh he looked pretty good. Fifty two point eight wins above replacement, a one twenty three OPS plus. When did he play? Uh, nineteen seventy to nineteen eighty six, most of which was with the Houston Astros. A little bit before our time. Yeah, but uh, okay, that's that's cool. I also don't know who fourth place is. Um, Edgar Renteria. Um. I don't know anything about... He's not nearly as good as the other guy was, but he's well, he has the World Series MVP. That's pretty cool. Then, I'd really love to see if what baseball players I would know that you wouldn't. There's definitely a few. But number five. Okay. Juan Soto. Fuck yeah, dude. Yeah, Juan Soto with his uh, 292. Two, uh, I didn't even know it was that high. I thought it was like in the 280s. Yeah, 292. Um, on base percentage, Juan Soto. First overall. What about home runs? Um, let me get there in a sec. Slugging, though, is actually not Juan Soto. It's some guy named Tony Canigliaro, who I also don't know who this is. You think then it's Italian? Mel Ott. Then it's Juan Soto. Then it's Bryce Harper. And then number six is Mickey Mantle. And number eight is Ken Griffey Jr. I know so many of these names. This is so much fun. Uh, Tony... Oh, Bryce Ken, Gif- Ken Griffey's not higher up on most of these. Tony Can- Canigliaro has 12.4 wins above replacement and one all-star season. Oh, he played for not very long. He played for eight years. Okay. Anyway, um, OPS, Juan Soto. Let's see what else he leads in. Uh, walks, Juan Soto. Uh, adjusted batting runs? Okay, so then who leads in home? Ooh, home runs is this weird fucking guy, Tony Canigliaro. I mean, did he hit? Yeah, did he had at least 25. Oh, okay. Yeah. That was off. Off by one. Yeah, Bryce Harper and Juan Soto are tied for second with 22. Yeah. Go figure, though. Ain't that some shit? Uh, anyway, I'm almost done. I didn't want to go into the 20s because uh, fuck them shits. But I did. <laughs> like, the sample size would be astronomically higher yeah, every it, year it, that we go up. Pitching. Oh, fuck. I don't know any young pitchers. So, yeah. Um. Uh, all right, let me ask you this, then. Something Luciano no, 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 is l- going to be. L- let me ask you this. Okay. Uh, what year do you think the uh, ERA leader of 18-year-olds pitched in? 1903. 1878. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, some guy named John Ward. Um, yeah, I'm going to pull up his page. I have, He's actually in the Hall of Fame. He has like 62 wins above replacement. He is a shortstop, second baseman, and pitcher. Batted left AKA through right. A.K.A. Zach Rieke. Um, He played for, what team is this? Uh, the Providence Grays before the New York Gothams. Uh, one season with the Brooklyn Wards Wanderers. Uh, then the Brooklyn Grooms. <laughs> and then eventually the New York Giants. Oh my fucking God. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's not a modern... Pl- so after him, it's some guy from 1874, Tommy Bond. Then it's Will Sawyer in 1883. There's not a single player on the in the top 10 for ERA of a player of 18 or, or younger. Um, there's not a single player from more recently than 1965. With the one player from 1965 being some guy named Larry Durker. I have no idea who this is. It doesn't matter. Um... 
yeah, there's there's a few names I recognize here. Like I I know um Bob Feller, uh, who led all eighteen year olds in um hits per nine. Uh, Bob Feller played with this um uh, the the Cleveland Indians for his entire career. Uh, he also led in strikeouts per nine, so that's something. Uh, but I. Yeah, there's there's no point in us continuing this 18 year old part because uh, so much of this page is from before World War One, <laughs> and uh, nothing mattered before then. <laughs> Not at all. Did society exist before World War One? Not in a meaningful way. Oh, of course. So if we were to go to 19, do you think that changes at all? <laughs> Probably a bit. Like really not though. John Ward still li- leads the the uh, all 19 year olds with wins. Um, in 1879, Tommy Bond still leads the 19-year-olds in ERA in 1875. Like, none of this shit changes. When so, was the last time there was, like, a really, really young pitcher that just kind of came out of nowhere? I would say Clayton Kershaw. How old was he when he debuted? Oh, actually, how old was he? He might have been, like, 22. I'll look it up. Um, so, anyway, I, I kind of put this out a few more years because I wanted to see at what point is this ERA guy going to be someone we recognize. All right? Um, and it doesn't for a while. But we do get some more interesting names that come up as you go forward. So, for 20 year olds, the leader in win loss percentage is Dwight Gooden. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, also, for 20 year olds, the leader in hits per nine is Jose Fernandez. Really? Yeah. So, like, there are, like, a slow. Change it, like there's still like Tommy Bond still on this list on, on these leaderboards a little bit. Um, oh, Dwight Gooden also led the league in shutouts as a 20 year old or led all of MLB. I don't, I don't know how to say that. Um, ERA still doesn't really change much for 21 year olds, but like there's more names we recognize now. Like Vita Blue is uh the best 21 year old for hits per nine. Uh, Roberto Osuna, Osuna, really, um, is the uh, has the most saves for any 21 year old in history. Hmm. Um. Yeah, Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth has the most shutouts of any twenty-one-year-old. I like how you were reading it, finished reading it, and then we're surprised that you just read that. Yeah, well, because like when you see a leaderboard that includes Babe Ruth, like, it's like you're not, you're not surprised. But then when no. you see a pitcher's leaderboard that has Babe Ruth, you're like, That's oh right. right, he did that. <laughs> uh, Walter Johnson led the um, uh, has the best home runs per nine of any twenty-one-year-old. Uh. Yeah, so it it it's interesting how it, like it really doesn't change much, like in the slightest. But now Corwin, let me ask you this question, and this will be my final question, as we as we will then finish up the episode. Pitchers aged season, pitcher leaders seasons age forty three. Maddox. Ah, uh, I don't see him anywhere. No. Give me some other names. Um, I don't know. Uh, Ty Cobb. He didn't pitch. <laughs> I knew that. Yeah, Cy Young is who I meant to say. Uh, I don't see. C- oh, here, he, Cy-, <laughs> Cy is the leader of forty-three-year-old players in FIP. <laughs> <laughs> Which that just tickles me. No, so Nolan Ryan leads a lot of these. Yeah, yeah. Nolan Ryan leads in hits per nine, strikeouts per nine, strikeouts. Um, there's hit by pitch, which isn't surprising in the slightest. Uh, Mariano Rivera leads in saves. Nice. Um, Bartolo Colon leads in strikeout to walk. Gaylord Perry leads in hits. Like what a name. Uh, Phil Necro leads in a lot of these. Actually, surprisingly, he leads in win loss percentage, game started, walks. Um, innings pitched. Yeah, so there's some interesting ones. Anyway, last but not least, batters, age 43 season. I don't know if I know any batters who batted until then. Wow, this is all like two dudes. Ty Holy Cobb. Shit. Um, no, I think Ty Cobb re- retired too early to make this list. Yeah, no, he's not here. Um, So much of this is Cap Anderson. Sorry, Cap, Cap Anson. I always do that to him. Cap Anson, who's like one of like the OG... Baseball players. Yeah, I know the name. Yeah, like his age 43 season was in 1895. Um, yeah, yeah, Corwin looked down. Yeah. So you, so I'm pitching. I just want to go back to that. You had it as uh, age 43. Or, yeah. Uh, Greg Maddox retired when he was 42. Oh, so, damn it. Yeah. Just missed this list. Yeah, Ichiro Suzuki leads all 43-year-olds in, like, games played. Um, Cap Anson's fucking everywhere here. Um... Carlton Fisk is here. Pete Rose is here. 
Hey, Pete Rose hiding, sliding headfirst into home plate. Who do you think? No, nah, it's not even a pointing question. There's no point in me having asking this question. Omar Vizquel. Oh, as actually here. Nice. Uh, yeah, he leads all 43-year-olds in caught stealing. <laughs> 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 and uh, we'll end on that. <laughs> Ooh, although, oh, although, we'll end on this. Stolen base percentage for 43-year-olds. There's only one man that's possibly Ricky Henderson. Ricky Henderson, 80%. <laughs> As a forty-three-year-old in two thousand two, it's, it's such a bullshit stat. I no eighty percent. Okay, hold on. I, I need to it's look. It's not at a this. bullshit stat because it's dumb. It's bullshit because it's unfair that he has that stat. Yeah, if modern day video games were made with Ricky Henderson in them, he would be the most broken character. He ever. would be Bo Jackson in Tecmo Bowl. Um. So, out of curiosity, how many stolen bases do you think he had in uh, his age forty-three season? Uh, probably thirty. Oh, this is why he leads in percentage. Because he has like five. He has eight. Okay. Yeah, yeah he had eight so in two thousand two with had Boston. Twenty attempts. And um, or not twenty attempts. Uh, two cost dealings. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, in L A. his age forty four season, his final year, he had three. But anyway, yeah. Imagine being Ricky Henderson and having three steals in a season. Imagine being Ricky Henderson. <laughs> <laughs> no, I cannot. The all-time MLB leader in three different categories. Runs, stolen bases, and caught stealing. All-time yeah, leader. That makes a lot of sense. Fucking Ricky. All right, anyway. Um, you can follow the show um, on Twitter. We have that one. Juicing Pod is our handle. That's there. You can also follow the show. Yeah, you can send us emails <laughs> uh, via our Gmail at juicingthenumbers at gmail.com. And you can find our website at juicingthenumbers.wixsite.com. Flash website. And until next time, until Thursday, y'all have a good one. Maybe.